New Spring. This is this is um this is this is my prayer this morning. Uh, I hope what we just saw, um, all those people getting baptized on every campus. I hope that never gets old. Like I hope that never, ever gets old. Um, let, let me tell you why. Like if you're the person that shows up and you know we do that and it's like oh crap here's baptism again. Um, I hope I hope you meet Jesus. I really do, because every time somebody goes under the water and they come back up, you know what I think of? That was me. That was me. Jesus paid for my sin, and that's why we clap. That's why we celebrate. You know, a, you know what's going on in the church by what they celebrate. And so we're going to celebrate. But last, week, last week on all of our campuses, we saw 199 people get baptized, and this week we'll probably see right at that. It's amazing, and I just hope as a church body to, to every campus— Hope that never, ever gets old to us. Amen? Amen. Yeah, we can clap. It's okay to clap with that. So, getting started really fast today on all of our campuses. Quick survey. The Super Bowl is next week. I just kind of like to know where our church is on every situation. Um, and so I was wondering how many people here are going to be pulling for the Green Bay Packers? Would you raise your hand? Green Bay Packers. Didn't know we had Green Bay people like that here. That is, like, seriously, I, uh, that's awesome. Okay, how many of you are going to be pulling for the Pittsburgh Steelers? Okay, wow. Okay, didn't know that many people cared. Now, this is, this is the camp I'm in. How many don't care? You just want to eat great food and watch the commercials. Yeah. Some of y'all raised your hands twice on every campus. Now, I don't have a place to watch the Super Bowl yet, so I'm saying the home group, the home group that has the best Super Bowl party, if you'll just shoot me an invitation, um, and, and with the invitation, I'm going to need to see the menu. That's how I make decisions. And so, anyway, um, I'll tell you what, if you have a Bible today, go ahead and grab them, open to 1 Samuel chapter 17. While you're turning there, that group thing, those, I know a lot of home groups are getting together. We've advertised groups, and if you're not in a group, man, I'd push that thing really hard. And by the way, especially Anderson Campus and Columbia, listen. Next week only, not, it's not a permanent thing, but next week only, remember, we're moving our Sunday night services in Anderson and Columbia to Saturday night. Same times, but Sunday night will be on Saturday night for one week only. And people have asked, have y'all ever considered Saturday night service? And I'm like, no, because we love college football and fall will be around here and y'all ain't going to show up anyway. So um, we're, we're going we're to move just for that one week and people go, is that a spiritual reason? Yes, because of the Super Bowl. That's why we're doing it. So that's next week, and then we'll get back right in. Let me pray, and uh, we'll dive right in. Father, in the name of Jesus today, God, I thank you for the work that you've already done on every campus today. It's been so amazing, God, that, to see you work. The fact that um, many people had to sit in traffic to get into church today is just a sign, Jesus, of what you, you, Jesus, are doing. And so I'm praying, God, that during this time, Father, that you will meet us where we are. There's a lot of people here today that have legitimate hurt in their life. And, Father, that you would begin to heal in an amazing way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you've ever had plans that didn't quite work out the way you expected them to work out, but I'm in the middle of that right now. Um, the last week of December every year, our New Spring offices shut down. Um, the whole, we give the staff the whole week off. Uh, they work really hard all year, and the Christmas services are unbelievable, and so we literally shut it down. And now, so during that particular week, I anticipate on a personal level a lot of things. I'm going to eat a lot of food uh, because that's what we do here in the South the last week of December, and we all go on a diet January 1, um, or not really January 1. It's whenever the Monday following that is, if we want to. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sleep in. I like to sleep in from time to time. Um, I, like to, uh, I like to spend a lot of time with my family. 
I like to travel a little bit. I mean, that last week, typically for me, is a very fun week. But this year was a little different. In fact, uh, about two weeks before Christmas, Lucretia, who's my wife, woke up and she wasn't feeling well. She just announced, she said, I'm not feeling well. And I was like, well, you're a doctor. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can pray, but I don't know. What, I don't, just, can you take something? You need a pill? And so she just, I just wanted you to know, smart Alec. And so she told me she wasn't feeling well. And she progressively got worse. Now, if you're a husband, you hate to see your wife sick because that means you have to clean the house. And, um, and so I hate... I hate seeing Lucretia sick because she really does so much. I didn't realize how much she did. Oh, my gosh, full-time moms, good gracious, praise the Lord for you. And so um, she, she, was getting, she was getting worse and worse and worse. And during that time, um, two things happened. A friend of mine offered, he said, that, hey, the last week of the year, why don't I pay for you? And he don't even go to this church, but he's like, why don't I pay for you and your wife to go to the Four Seasons um, down in somewhere in Florida and relax. And so we prayed about it for about two seconds and figured that was the will of God. And so we agreed to that. And, and so she kept getting sicker and sicker. And, so, and, and then another guy, called, or the same guy called me and said, hey man, um, I'm going to Nashville um, to go see Garth Brooks perform. Would you and your wife like to come? And just straight up, I'm a Garth fan. I love, listen, mama's in the graveyard, papa's in the pen. And so, but, but we couldn't go. We couldn't go. And I was like, well, my wife's sick, so I wanted to go that. I couldn't go that. And then she got sicker and sicker, and she went to the doctor, and di- well, she was diagnosed with strep throat. So that, that little Four Seasons vacation, by the way, that we weren't going to have to pay for, canceled. In fact, sleeping in for Perry, canceled. Canceled. And I felt, I felt bad for Karis because I would have to go get Karis up in the morning and I would get her out of the house because Lucretia's sick. She had strep throat. By the way, she's on antibiotics. She's not getting better. She goes back to the doctor. They give her stronger antibiotics. She's still not getting better. So I'm getting Karis out of bed. I can't dress the poor girl. We're walking into Waffle House. She looks homeless with her hair everywhere. I just, like, doesn't match. I'm like, I don't even know. You know, so the period, it's 28 degrees outside. She's in short sleeves. I'm like, she's tough. Wasn't working out. Lucretia's not getting better. She goes back to the doctor. She does some blood work. She's diagnosed with mono. So I've got a wife with strep throat and mono. Quick question. Is my life going as planned? No, because when mama gets sick, nothing's right in the house. And I've I've had to make some adjustments, and I appreciate those that have blogged and tweeted and Facebooked and carrier pigeoned in messages about my wife this week. You saw it on the blog that she was sick, and you've been praying for her, and I would ask that you continue to pray for her. She's getting a little bit better, but my life had to make some serious adjustments. I, I had all these plans to go here and do this and sleep in, but sometimes in life we have to make adjustments, don't we? Now, that's a funny story. We can all laugh and ha ha, and if you're especially a husband, if the wife's ever got sick, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But there's some situations here today on every campus that's not so funny. Like, at one point, maybe it was a year ago, 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you had some plans, but things haven't quite gone like you anticipated. For example, you planned on the marriage, but you didn't plan on the divorce. And, hey, nobody ever does. I've never done a wedding. They said, man, we're going to be married for about four years and then we're going to hate each other and have an unbelievable custody battle. It's never happened. But for some of you, that's happened this year. You you planned, listen, you planned on trying to have children. You didn't plan on the miscarriage. But it happened. You planned on spending the rest of your life With your spouse, you didn't plan on their death. You never planned on attending your own children's funeral. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do when bad things happen to good people? When, when life doesn't go according to plan, because here's what I know about every person here today. There's something in your past that you can look back on, and here's the question. God, why? And let me tell you something. That's a legitimate question. Some of you have been lectured. You've been told, don't ask God questions. 
And usually that's by people that are intimidated that you would ask a question in the first place. And then what they do is they, they take some verses from Job and misapply them. Amen. If you've got questions for God, let me tell you something. Questions are natural. And I'm going to, listen, listen, we're going to answer, I'm going to answer for you today, why do bad things happen to good people? That's not the right question, because let me tell you something. You will never get the answer to the question why. Never. You will never understand why that tragedy took place in your life, this side of eternity. Today, all I want to do is change your questions. Because, listen, we, we're in this series called Make War. And we started out week one by saying that, that, that you're, e you're in the battle. And you're either on this hill, and we use this hill right here to represent the Philistines, which were enemies of God. So here today, you're either an enemy of God, and you're either a hostile enemy or an indifferent enemy. And by the way, let me just say this. It doesn't really end well for enemies of God anywhere in the scriptures. So you're either an enemy of God, or you've trusted in the cross of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you've become a child of God. But we said a lot of people that are children of God never really make it to that next level in life. They never really achieve what God wants them wants for their lives. And there's several reasons. And we talked about the next week about how many people allow the enemy to define their life. And we talked about Goliath and how he would come out and how he paralyzed an entire nation of people. And we said that many times we allow the enemy to define us rather than Scripture and, and Jesus to define us. And we talked about in Christ we are totally forgiven. In Christ we are valuable and chosen. And in Christ we are unconditionally loved. And last week I talked about how some people get stuck because they never understand the gifting that they have in Christ. And we talked about stopping to stop, the, stop playing with the paper and the box and use the gift that God has given you. We talked about that. But I would say this. A lot of people that I know that are, that are Christians, they've legitimately met Christ. They are understanding Scripture. They get stuck in their Christian walk because you and I, we have problems getting past the tragedy, listen to me, that happened to us. I'm not talking about something you did. I'm talking about something that legitimately happened to you. The death of a friend, the, 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 the cancer report, the disease, the problem, the whatever. Something legitimately happened to you and you're wrestling with God. If you love me, why do you let that happen? Let me tell you three things before we really get into the text today. Let me tell you three things. There's three fundamental principles that we got to understand before we get into why do, why do bad things happen to good people. Number one, God is good. God is good. God, is, like we learned to pray that when we were kids, didn't we? Come on now. Would you like to say the blessing? Yes, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Like we, we've got that one. Well, like we, we said that when we were three. And I just, I just, I know, I know some people in, in here today, you have a problem with the goodness of God going, well, if God's good, why did this happen? And you know, you know, one thing we don't talk about is last century, the two bloodiest movements of last century were led by people that said there, aren't, there isn't a God. Nobody ever wants to talk about that. But I, I just want to read you some stuff that Jesus said, and we're going to dive into that question because I think it's a fair question. This is what Jesus said about the goodness of God. Now, once again, I know it messes people up, but we're just going to go straight Jesus here. Matthew 7. And if you grew up in church, you've heard these first two verses. You've never heard the, maybe the rest of them explained. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Those are great verses, but let's read the rest and, and put it in today's context. Which of you, this is Jesus, which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Now, stop. That's jacked up. Like, let's say you're a dad, and you and your kid are going through the Chick-fil-A drive-thru. And you want one of those spicy chicken sandwiches, because they're good, aren't they? And you want one of those spicy chicken sandwiches, and you got your son, or you got your daughter with you, and they go, Daddy, I would like a spicy chicken sandwich. And you go, no. And you open the door, and you pick up a rock, and you put it in your lap, and you go, there's your dinner. That's a little jacked up, isn't it? Like, nobody goes, that's a father of the year right there. Let's put him on the TV. But let, Jesus, he makes another point. Let's, I love this. Or, if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. What dad does that? Like, you're, you, you go to Long John Silver's. You're getting the big fish dinner. You know, those things will send you to Jesus just like that. And your kid walks up and goes, Daddy, I would like a big fish dinner. And you go, no. 
here's a cobra. Yeah. You know, and the kids go freaking out, running around, snake chasing them around Long John Silver's. Like if I'm in Long John Silver's and you do that to your kid, I'm calling BSS on you. That's a jacked up dad. Now read this. this is, Jesus is just making a point. If you then, if you then, he's talking to us, if you then, though you are evil, which we don't like, we, we, know, we know evil people, but we're not evil. Jesus said we're evil. Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. And we know how to give good gifts to our kids. Look at this. How much, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Translation. God doesn't give bad gifts. He doesn't. Listen, we've, we all know people that give bad gifts, don't we? Come on now. We, we, use that, we say that crap every year at Christmas. Well, it's not the gift, it's the thought that counts. And I'm like, quit thinking then. Don't ever think again. Please don't think. That is awful. Don't, what am I supposed to even do with wind chimes? Anyway, so I, we get bad gifts. And the Bible says that God doesn't give bad gifts. To which the pushback would be, well, Perry... How, how can you say God is good when this happened to me? I, I don't know. It's legitimate tragedy. Here's what I know. God is good. And a lot of people go, well, I don't think God's good because of what happened to me. See, here's the question we've really got to answer. Are we going to allow circumstances to determine our belief in God? Or are we going to allow our belief in God to reign over our circumstances? Because the person that trusts in their circumstances and said, you're God, God, you're good as long as I'm married, as long as my kids are healthy, as long as I'm disease-free, and as long as I have a job, the thing I know about you is you're not following Jesus, you're worshiping a genie because you want a God that will give you everything you ask for. But on the flip side, to say that God is good, and a lot of people, well, if, if God is good, why did that happened to me. Well, I would say one of, the, one of the things that we lose sight of so many times is the goodness of God. God, you didn't give me this, and you didn't give me this, and you didn't give me this. It would be equivalent to a four-year-old screaming at his or her parents on Christmas morning, surrounded by thousands of dollars worth of toys, but upset with mommy and daddy because she or he didn't get the puppy. Do you know how surrounded you are by the goodness of God? Come on now. You had the goodness of God everywhere in your life. Let me, let me prove it. Um, you woke up in a house this morning. That would be called the goodness of God. You went to a closet and most of us had options when it came to clothing today. That's the goodness of God. Many of us ate a hot breakfast, or at least we had the choice to eat food in our house. That's the goodness of God. Many of us will go out to eat today. That is the goodness of God. Most of us rode to church today in a car. That is the goodness of God. Many of us are listening to this sermon. That is the goodness of God. Many of us have a roof over our head, food on our table, shoes on our feet. That is the goodness of God. God is good. The problem is, we think all that goodness is the result of our own effort. And if God didn't want you to have it, it's gone. God is good. I've had people push back, going, if God is good, explain 9 11. Explain those airplanes flying into those buildings. Once again, we want to blame God when the bad things happen, but here's my counter argument. Thousands of planes take off and land every single day safely, and God never gets the credit, the praise, or the glory when they land safely. But you let one fall out of the sky and see who gets the blame. God is good. Well, if God is good, Perry, why is this pain in my life? You know what? Sometimes God uses pain in our lives to identify a problem and pull something out of us that was eventually going to kill us. Have your, has your appendix ever busted? Has your appendix ever busted? That's pretty painful from what I understand. 
And to walk into a surgery room and see a surgeon take a scalpel and cut somebody, if you don't know what's going on, you're like, that's mean, that's cruel. And the surgeon would respond to you, "Uh uh-uh. If I don't cut them, if I don't hurt them, if I don't wound them, then what's in them will kill them. So I've got to use pain to pull something out of them. At the end of the day, even through pain, God is good. God is good. Listen. You say, Perry, you don't know my situation. You're right. I don't know your situation. I know mine. I watched my mother be diagnosed with cancer and die within three months when I was 12 years old. God is good. Right now, I'm watching my father die from Alzheimer's. I take my little girl to see him every Saturday. He don't even know her name. I haven't heard my father say I love you in years. He's losing his mind. Listen to me, people. God is good. God is good. He's good when I'm healthy. He's good when I'm sick. We serve a God that's good. See, we've got to get this down. Because when you learn and I learn to praise God as good in spite of the circumstances, I've seen circumstances change. In the Old Testament, I was reading a story the other day about how the army of Israel is going out to fight, and there's these three massive armies together coming against them. And by the way, if you lost a battle in those days, things went bad. Entire villages and everybody in the village was destroyed, and they're on the way out to face this army, and they put the worship leaders in front of the army, and the worship leaders began to sing a song that said this, God is good, his love endures forever. He is good, his love endures forever. And through them praising God in the midst of the enemy beginning to oppress them God delivered them from the enemy because they recognized his goodness in spite of the overwhelming circumstances that were coming upon them God is good I read this morning in Acts chapter 16 where Paul was beaten the Bible says flogged if you've seen the movie the passion of the Christ that's what a flogging is and when he gets in prison and they fasten him in the stocks what did he begin to do in Acts chapter 16 he began to sing hymns I believe he sang the hymn that is most repeated in the Old Testament he is good and his love endures forever forever and when he started praising God as being good God performed the very first edition of jailhouse rock by shaking up the jail so much that the prison doors flew open and the chains fell off of everybody's wrist because one person was willing to stand in the middle of unbelievable circumstances and declare God is good I was reading the book of Habakkuk the other day and Habakkuk says this this blue my mind it doesn't really fit into really um, it doesn't really fit into church theology today But this is Habakkuk, and he's praising God. But I want you to listen to what he's praising God for. The Bible says in Habakkuk 3, verse 17, Though the fig trees, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. In other words, Habakkuk is saying, Though all hell's breaking loose in my life, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of, flea, feet of a deer and enables me to go on the heights. God is good. Second thing I would tell you about God is God is all-powerful. God is all-powerful. God is not, I heard a preacher say this one time, it's so beautiful, God is not an ambulance driver who's responding from crisis to crisis. It's all powerful. Think about the power of God. I, I was thinking about this way the other day. I went, and I, I went one time. I remember going. In fact, I was born in California, so I, I've gone to the Pacific Ocean many times. And if you're on the Charleston campus, I know some of you down there surf. And I've never really seen any big waves in the Atlantic Ocean. And some of you might push back and go, oh, I remember the hurricane. Okay, listen, moron. <laughs> I'm supposed to surf in those things. Anyway, so I, but the Pacific Ocean, the waves are really big. And I was out at a beach, I was at, it's actually called Bolsa Chica Beach. I was at Bolsa Chica Beach with some friends. And, and like I'm standing there and the waves were huge that day. And so I'm standing there, but my back is to the waves and my friends are facing me. And there's a monster wave. I never will forget this. There's this monster wave coming towards me. And my friends, my really good friends, you ever done this? They don't tell me the wave's coming. They're like, <laughs> I'm like, what, man? I want to laugh too. I want to laugh too. What is it? The next thing I know, Bam! My face is on the floor of the Pacific Ocean. I'm like, see you. And I'm getting, like, shorts go down to the ankles. I'm begging God to save everybody. I come back up. I'm like, bam! 
bam, another wave hits me. Has this ever happened to you? And you're getting drugged like you cleaned the ocean. Like the ocean is clean now because you get drugged all over the place. The, the ocean, the water is powerful. If you've ever been caught in a rip current, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And then the, you think about all that power in the ocean. And the Bible says he holds the waters on the earth in the hollows of his hands. I, I, don't, I can't even wrap my mind around that. But he's all-powerful. Think about how large the universe is, like 27 billion light years or something like that, and it's expanding. And the Bible says God like holds it between his thumb and his index finger, and he's like, this is my universe. I mean, as we read the scriptures, we, do, we, we clearly see he is a manna-giving, water-walking, grave-robbing, miracle-working God. He is all-powerful. God is good. God is all-powerful. But number three, bad things happen. Bad things happen. I was thinking about this yesterday when I was jumping with Karis on her trampoline. And uh, I double-bounced her one time. It was awesome. She came down <laughs> this morning. <laughs> anyway, it was so much. She's like, Daddy, don't do that again. <laughs> but have, have you jumped on a trampoline lately? They're safe, aren't they? Like, they've got the netting, you know? I mean, you, I mean, like, it is completely safe to jump on a trampoline. But I remember back in the day when I first started jumping on trampolines. Y'all remember that? Like, springs are all hanging up, you know, the hole in the trampoline. And you put it beside a hill, and you double bounce your friend, and he would fly off the trampoline down the hill, break. Something always got broke on somebody every... And, and I'm like, I was thinking about this yesterday. Every one of us in this room today, no matter what campus you're on, we want God to put the net up around the trampoline, and we want to jump for the rest of our life. But you know what? Here's reality. Every one of us are going to die. Some of you are like, is he always like this? Does he have Prozac? i got a friend that could hook him up. No, listen, listen. You don't get to pick when either. Like, we're going to experience legitimate tragedy. Bad things are going to happen. Amen. Why? Well, because there's evil in the world. And people push back and go, well, why doesn't God just wipe out all the evil? <laughs> Only problem with that. If he did it today at 12, none of us would be here at 12.01. We want God to take away everybody else's ability to choose, except we don't want him to take away ours. And so, if you have your Bibles, go to 1 Samuel 17. Out, keeping these things in mind, that bad things happen, tragedy happens... There are people in this room that the tragedy in your life, listen, if we were to bring you on this stage, give you a microphone, and let you tell about the tragic situation that haunts you, by the time you got done with your story, we would be weeping because what happened to you is legitimately a bad thing in your mind. And I'm not going to diminish that. But I want to teach you two things very quickly before we leave today. And by the way, we will, we will next week, listen to me, church, next week will be one of the top five services we've ever had in the history of New Spring Church, ever, as we go into part two of why do bad things happen to good people. But I want to teach you two things today that are essential for us to learn as a church body before we go into next week and the rest of this Make War series. Number one, God does not punish his children. He prepares them. God does not punish his children. He prepares them. There are some people here that you were taught that anything bad, that any, anytime something bad happened in your life, that was the result of you doing something bad and God is punishing you. Do you know, have you, I mean, have you read the Bible? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel 3, why did they wind up in the fire? Answer, because they obeyed God and did what he said. Sometimes we experience tragedy and bad things because we're doing exactly what God told us to do. So I would say to you, God's not punishing you. He's preparing you for something great. Now, now I, listen, I had never seen this in this text until God woke me up at 4 o'clock in the morning in December and gave me this entire series, and I got to this text right here, and I have, I've read this story 50 times. 
and I've never seen what I'm about to share with you. It's, it's in, it's, I've never seen it. Let's just start reading in verse um, 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. In other words, we talked about that last week. David said, I'm willing to give everything. I'm willing to give my life. I'm a living sacrifice. Verse 33, Saul replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy and he has been a fighting man from his youth. Translation, I'm not doing anything for great for God, but I don't want you to do anything great for God either. We talked about that last week. Verse 34. But, set, but David said to Saul, now look at this. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Let me stop. Because I've got to explain this or it doesn't make sense. Really quick question on every campus. Got to do a quick survey. Everybody participate. How many of you have a dog? Raise your hand. The dog people here. That's awesome. Love dogs. Love dogs. Now, how many of you, like, have a dog? And I'm not going to make fun of you, but I want you to be serious with me, okay? Like, you straight up legitimately love that dog. Like, he kisses you in the mouth, love that dog. Oh, wow, that was a lot of hands went down. Oh, come on now. I've, been I've got some friends. This is no lie. They love their dogs. Um, I, I was told, you always hear stories about the dog. Dogs are stupid. Yeah, how many times your dog fed you? Anyway, um, I, I always heard stories about dogs. And so I have some friends like, yeah, my dogs watch TV. I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I was over at their house. They have a TV for the dogs, and the dogs straight up have their favorite TV shows and straight up watch TV. <laughs> I've never seen anything like it in my life. I had another, uh, some other friends that attend here at the Anderson campus. I did their wedding. Um, they got married on a boat, and they brought their weenie dogs with them. Real cute, real fat, like little bellies dragging the ground, you know, couldn't even walk. He just kind of rolled them down. Yeah, so anyways, I've got a friend that their dog, something was wrong with him and took him to the vet. The vet told him that the dog was depressed and they went out and bought anti-anxiety medicine for their dog. Listen, listen, listen. They love their dog. Straight up. I'm talking about dogs. I'm not talking about cats. Cats in this church is a church discipline issue. But dogs. Now, Think about, think about that, think about a dog lover and, and think about that love that you maybe have for your dog and multiply it times a thousand. That was the love that David had, or a shepherd, because David was a shepherd, that was the love that a shepherd had for his sheep. See, we can't understand this, but David loved his sheep. Loved his sheep. David was about 17 or 18 years old. And most 17, 18 years old here at New Spring Church, no matter what campus, they don't love sheep. Because, I mean, seriously, I've never, I've never had a teenager come to me upset because their sheep got missing. That has never happened in the history of this church. But because you guys have all kinds of things to keep you distracted, you got Facebook and Twitter and stuff like that, David's Facebook status would have went hanging with the sheep. David's Twitter would have looked like hanging with his sheep, loving the sheep. Cussing the sheep, you know, whatever. But he, ultimately, he loved his sheep. When Jesus talks about the, the relationship between a sheep and a shepherd in John chapter 10, there's some unbelievable things there because Jesus talked about a sheep knows its shepherd's voice. That's how close that relationship was. So when a shepherd would speak to its sheep, the sheep could have its back turned to the shepherd but recognize the voice of the shepherd. Like somebody else could come up and tell the sheep to do something and the sheep wouldn't listen to him because the sheep and the shepherd had that connection. It was something. And that's why when Jesus talks about in John chapter 15, if a man has a hundred sheep and he loses one, will he not go and find it? See, our culture can't identify that with that because every one of us go, no. I mean, you got a hundred sheep and you lose one. We live in America. You just go get another one at Walmart. So David, don't miss this, because if we miss this, we miss the whole point of the story. David loved his sheep. So David's talking about when, a, when, it, when, when I was hanging with a sheep. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock on a stop. Why don't you listen to me? To David... This was tragedy. Straight up tragedy. Shepherds feared something happening to their sheep. Now, to us, it's not tragedy. It's like, it's a sheep. But to David, it's tragedy. By the way, let me stop and say this real quick. Don't you ever 
call someone else's tragedy a non-tragedy. We don't get to define tragedy for other people. What we may see as a big deal may be a life stopper in their, in their life. We can't define tragedy for other people. I'm telling you, in David's life, this was tragedy. Parents, I would equate it to this. Every one of us that are parents, especially the parents of teenagers, you know what you fear the most? You fear that phone call, don't you? For me, anytime the phone rings after 10 o'clock at night, the first thought that pops in my mind is, who died? Because nobody calls after 10 to go, what's up, dog? This was straight up tragic in David's life. And here's, don't, don't miss this. David could have just broken down, cried, got angry at God, and said, why? At this point, David could have said, I'm not a good shepherd. God hates me. Nothing good is ever going to happen in my life. If I was good, why did these sheep get stolen? I love these sheep. Why did this tragic event have to happen to me? And David could have cried and complained and allowed his tragedy to define him for the rest of his life. And I meet so many people that say that Jesus lives inside of them, but when you begin to push down on them, they're allowing a tragedy to define them. And let me tell you something. That was a tragedy in your life. That happened. That hurt. But if you stay there, you're never going to become the person that God wants you to be. I want you to look and see what David did. Look at, look at what, this is crazy. This is crazy. I went after it. Verse, 30, verse 35 says, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. Can you imagine that? Can you walk, walk through that scene in your mind. 17-year-old boy, looking around, confused, upset, frightened, and finally he went, a lion ain't going to steal my sheep. Wait. Hey, hey, quit over here acting like a fool. Come here, come here. And he goes after the lion. And the Bible says he backhands it. And the lion's like, what? And he takes it, give me my sheep. Starts walking away. Listen, David refused to allow tragedy to define him. He said, somebody took my sheep. Something took my sheep. But I'm not going to sit here in the sheep pen for the rest of my life and ask God why and tell God how mean and how cruel he is because, and last week we talked about in 1 Samuel 16, David was anointed. He had the Spirit of God living in him, which means in today's society that we have Jesus Christ living in us. And David was essentially saying, with Christ in me, I will not be identified by tragedy. I will be identified by triumph. Let me go smack the lion in the mouth. That is what propelled him out of the sheep pen. Listen, if David stays in the sheep pen, guess what happens? We never read the story of David and Goliath. Because he's mad at God for the rest of his life. Can you see that? Like, I, I'm not going after a lion. Like, I remember when I went to Kenya, I was asking the guy, the, the, the guy that was leading the trip, I was like, can we, can we go for runs in Kenya? Like, when we stay the most, can we go for runs? He went, no. I was like, why? He said, because there's lions. <laughs> I went, that's not a big deal. He said, are you faster than a lion? I was like, no, but I'm going to run with Jake. I'm faster than Jake. Every time I tell that story, Jake's like, ha, 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 that's funny. Jake getting killed. Ha, 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 I love that. You know, pray for Jake. I'm going to be straight up. Let's say Jake and I went for a run. I love Jake. I love Jake. Love his family. I love Jake. But if we'd been running and a lion would have came after us and a lion would have gotten Jake, I, I ain't going after Jake. I mean, like, sucks to be Jake. I mean, Jake, sorry, bro. See, we're so intimidated by that tragedy sometimes that we won't go after it. But look, look at what else David did. Now, this next part is crazy. I can't. People say the Bible's boring. We, we just don't read it. Look at this. When it turned on me, 
Okay, the lion just got backhanded by a 17-year-old boy. He's a little mad. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. That's a bad dude. He wore like a John Deere hat backwards, probably chewed tobacco, and you just didn't mess with David. The Bible, the lion came after him. He was like, hold, put the, oh, oh, no, you did not. And he killed the lion. David not only got out of the sheep pen and refused to let the tragedy define him, he said, I'm going to go after this tragedy because I have victory over it. I don't have to be intimidated by it. I don't have to wor be worried by it. And listen, church, I don't have to be identified by it. Because that tragedy is going to lead me to triumph. And that's where David lived. Not in tragedy, but in triumph. And as a follower of Jesus Christ, we have a choice. Be defined by tragedy or be defined by triumph. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to live on the triumph side. Because when David got past his tragedy, he was able to face a greater giant that eventually set a nation free. Because he refused to let his tragedy identify him. What are you going to do? Tragedy or triumph? See, it's no mistake that the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 that the devil prowls around look like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Isn't it funny that a lion stole David's sheep? The Bible says the enemy prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And what he will do is he will roar at you through your tragedy and say, if God loved you, if God loved you, if God loved you, why did that happen? And I'm just challenging our church today to step up like David did and smack the lion in the mouth because he can roar, but he has no teeth because Jesus kicked him out on the cross. We have triumph over any tragedy that tries to define us. David didn't ask why. I want you to look at the two questions he asked. We'll, we'll see them right here. Verse 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. God was not punishing David with the lion and the bear. God was preparing him to face Goliath. God was not punishing David with the lion and the bear. God was preparing him to face Goliath. But if he never gets out of the sheep pen, he never faces greater things. God was not punishing you when that happened to you. He was preparing you to face giants down the road that he will use you to overcome for his glory and to advance the body of Christ. God does not punish his children. He's preparing you. And with that tragedy, the way that you begin to live in victory is you go from tragedy to triumph today. Today is the day that you stop letting this identify you and you let victory in Christ identify you because in Christ and only in Christ, you have triumph over the tragedy in your past. We've got to get this. David didn't ask why. He asked two questions. These are the two questions that will change our perspective on tragedy. The first question that David was asking according to this text is, Lord, who are you? Who are you? You see it in the text. You know what David said about God? He said two things in this text. Number one, he's the living God. He is not dead. He is active. He's the living God. And the second thing he said about God is God is faithful. Yeah, David, David, you lost two sheep. Yeah, God is faithful. God is faithful. He asked the question who, and then he asked the question what. God, what do you want me to do? Because I believe it was the spirit of the living God inside of him that propelled him and said, get out of that sheep pen, boy, and go smack the lion in the mouth. Listen to me, church. If you've got pain in your life, don't waste it. Don't waste your pain. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that God works for the good and of all who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I don't know how God can bring good out of that tragedy, but here's what I know. He can bring good out of that tragedy. 
Second thing is crucifixion leads to resurrection. Crucifixion leads to resurrection, church. Did you know that? Crucifixion leads to resurrection. Let me ask our church body something today. Have you ever studied the life of Jesus and noticed the tragedy that he had in his life? Jesus, when he was here on earth, he didn't have an easy life. I mean, look at his birth. Look at his birth. Like, we've glorified his birth at Christmas. We've made it something that it's not. But the Savior of the world was born into an area of the world that was supposed to, def- to, sp- supposed to identify him and see him for who he was. But what happened? He went, to, he went to Bethlehem. They couldn't even find a Motel 6. And folks, listen, it wasn't like the innkeeper said, we don't have any room, but we've got an awesome nativity scene out back. If you'd like to put Jesus, we got some wise men and shepherds. We haven't figured out why they're here. We obviously know now. He was born in horrible conditions. If we were to go back and watch the whole thing today, we would say, man, that's a tragedy. That kid had to be born like that. Jesus was like two or three years old when a very insecure king in that area found out that Jesus had been born. And he ordered, listen to me, the murder of every child under a certain age in that area. Would we call that tragedy? Jesus had to escape to Egypt. His mother and father had to take him to Egypt. And finally God told him to come back out of Egypt, so they came back and they grew up in this village. And we don't know, we don't know at what age, but biblical evidence seems to suggest that Joseph's earth, I mean, Jesus' early um, earthly father, Joseph, died somewhere between the age of 12 and 30 years old in Jesus' life. That's tragedy. If you've ever lost a parent, it's tragedy. Jesus' childhood was tragic. I'll take some heat for this, but I'm going to say exactly what I mean. Jesus in his village was considered by many to be a bastard child. Have you ever thought about that? People, come on. Do you think everybody in his village bought that whole virgin birth story? Jesus would walk by and they'd be like, yeah, that boy don't even know who his daddy is. I'm sure Jesus would smile and go, oh, I know who my daddy is. You will too one day. It's kept, kind of kept on going. The ministry of Jesus, when he started his ministry, see, we've glorified that thing too. We got pictures of him and he's healing people and manna and all that. Listen, listen, listen. Do you know after the first sermon that Jesus ever preached in the Gospel of Luke, the first sermon he ever preached, they grabbed him and took him to the cliff in the city and were going to throw him off and kill him? Now, I preached some bad ones. That has never happened. It's tragic. Did you know as we read the Gospels that there was a group of men right when Jesus launched his ministry, very early into his ministry, that they did nothing but travel around, criticize, and try to tear apart Jesus, and for three years did nothing but plot how they were going to kill him. Can we say that's tragedy? The night he was betrayed, he sat down at a table. You've seen the painting. You've read the story. And one of his closest friends, Judas Iscariot, was actually the man that was going to betray him. Betrayed by one of his closest friends. Tragedy. He took three of those guys and went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. They couldn't even stand, they couldn't even stay up. They couldn't support him in his toughest time. Tragedy. He he was so tense during that moment, he was sweating drops of blood. I would call that tragedy, and so would you if it happened in your life. They come to arrest Jesus, and all of his closest friends abandon him. This is tragedy. After they arrested him, the scriptures say they spit on him. They mocked him. They tore his beard out with their hands, ripped it just right out of his face. They put a crown of thorns on his head and beat the the crown of thorns down on his head with a rod. By the way, by the way, he did this for us. They put him on trial. They beat him with a cat of nine tails over And over and over again, if you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, that's about the most accurate picture that you could ever see. 
They put a cross on his back. They forced him to carry it until he couldn't carry it anymore. He passed out probably from dehydration. They finally got him to the place of Golgotha. They put nails in his wrist. They put nails in his feet. They put a pillow behind his back, not for his comfort, but to push him out so his lungs would fill up with blood. And for six hours, he hung on a cross and endured separation from the Father and gave his life so that you and I could be made right with God. But as we look at that event, we would call that tragic. That's a tragedy that that would happen to a man that had never sinned. And on Friday, they took him down and they wrapped his body up. And the Bible says they put him in a borrowed tomb. And he's kind of, they were going to borrow it for a little while. I love the fact that our religious leader has a borrowed tomb. Everybody else is still in theirs, but our religious leader had a borrowed tomb. And on Friday, all day Friday, for the rest of the day Friday, people would walk by that tomb or they'd see that cross. They would say, man, what a tragedy. All day Saturday, people would see the tomb or they would walk by the cross and they would say, what a tragedy. Tragedy defined Christianity. Tragedy defined this moment, this movement. We thought he was this, but now he's that because he's in the tomb. What a tragedy. Tragedy defined it on Saturday. Tragedy defined it on Friday. But Sunday morning, church, Sunday morning, tragedy turned into triumph. Because two angels said, you know what, I've got my assignment. My assignment is to go remove that stupid stone from in front of the grave. They come down, they remove the stone, they go in. Jesus is like, what took you so long? He's already folded up the burial cloth. And through our Lord and Savior, tragedy turned into triumph as he came out of the grave. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He rules and reigns today. And one day he's coming back to take us all from in this earth. Crucifixion, leave leads to resurrection. Tragedy leads to triumph. And if Christ can move from tragedy to triumph, so can his followers. Some of you today, it's time to get out of that grave. It's time to get out of that sheep pen because God's got greater things. Listen, your hurt is real. But in Christ, we walk from tragedy to triumph and into greater things, not because we're so good, but because he is good and he is all powerful. Let me read to you out of the book of Isaiah as we get ready to close. Isaiah 43 has been a passage that's always just meant so much to me. This is what the Bible says. But, but now this is what the Lord says. By the way, it's pretty important when the Bible says that to really pay attention because this is what God says. And listen, this is what God says to every one of his children. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel. Then he says this, fear not. Folks, did you know that phrase is in the Bible 366 times? One for every day of the year, including leap year? Fear not. Why do we not have to fear? For I have redeemed you. I have um, summoned you by name, and you are mine. And he says this, he says, when you pass through the waters, folks, he doesn't say if. God says in this world, you're going to experience tragedy. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. In other words, I'm not going to deliver you from that tragedy but I will walk with you through it. Hey, give me any tragedy plus Jesus and I'll go. Give me, give me anything, but you give me Jesus, I can walk through it. And with Christ, we can overcome anything. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Why? 
for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In Christ, and in Christ alone, you don't have to let that define you anymore. And my prayer is today is the day you simply decide to walk from tragedy to triumph. Let's pray as a church. Every campus, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I pray during these next few moments that this would be holy ground. And God, that you would have your way in the lives of every man and woman in this room on every campus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to pray for many of you today. I want to pray for many of you that you have been marked by tragedy in your life. There's been something happened in your past. There's been something that happened to you. You've been asking the question why. Maybe you've even wrestled with being angry at God. Hey, you know what? Lots of people have done that. But as you've listened to this message all day today, you sat there, you've been like, that's what I want. I, I don't want this tragedy to define me. I don't want to, I don't, I, I want to move today from tragedy to triumph and step into the life that God has for me. Because asking why <clears throat> the rest of our lives is not going to get us where we need to be. But who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? And God, I'll use this tragedy for your glory if you can use it. On every campus right now, if that's you, there's that tragedy in your past that you can't get over. I just want to pray for you right now. I just want to pray for you. And if you're here on every campus and you just, that's you and you want to be prayed for, then no matter, where you're, no matter where you're seated, I just want you to simply stand up and remain standing. Every campus right now. Every campus. You might be in Greenville going, Perry, you can't see me. Howard's there. He can see you. He's your campus pastor. Columbia Alden can see. In Charleston, Andy can see. In Florence, Michael can see. East and West Auditorium here in Anderson, we can see. If you need to be prayed for, I'm telling you, stand up because I just want to pray for you. All over the building. I'm, today, I want to move. I want to move, Pastor. I want to move from tragedy to triumph. I have some legitimate hurt in the balcony here in Anderson right now. I've got some legitimate hurt. I've got some legitimate pain. But today, today's the day I want to get over it. I want to move from tragedy to triumph right now, right now. We just want to pray for you, but if you need prayer, I just want you to stand up all over the room right now. Listen, don't miss this opportunity to be prayed for. If this is you, if you're struggling with it, it's okay. Some of you are embarrassed to stand up because you don't want people to know you're struggling. Listen, the church is a place where we should be able to come and admit our struggles and receive prayer and receive ministry and receive healing. If you need on every campus right now someone to pray for you, I want you to stand up. I just want to pray for you. That's all I'm going to do. That's all I'm going to do. I want to pray for you. Perry, I'm having problems moving past this. I'm having problems moving past this. Today, I want to move from tragedy to triumph. All over every campus right now, people are standing to be prayed for. Here's what I want you to do as a body of believers. If somebody's standing next to you, or in front of you, would you just stand up beside them, put your hand on their shoulder and pray for them? Right now, just do it. Here, I don't even know them. That's fine. Go ahead. Some of y'all might be thinking, oh, wait, this is weird. No, people, this is church. Church is not a place where you show up and pretend to be perfect and go home. Somebody standing near you, just put your hand on them and pray for them. Lift them up. You don't even have to know their name. God knows their name and he knows everything about their situation. The Bible says he knows every hair on their head. Father, right now in the name of Jesus on every campus, I just pray. God, that every person standing to be prayed for right now would feel your presence in their life in a greater way than they've ever felt your presence before. Father, I pray that you would bring hope out of this tragedy. I pray that you would bring healing from this tragedy. I pray, Lord Jesus, right now in your powerful name that you would help every man and woman that has stood to walk from the tragedy in their life to the triumph that you provide in Christ. 
Father, I pray for powerful healing to take place. For these people standing, God, to know that in you, and only in you, Jesus, we have victory. That we'll stop asking why. And we'll start asking, who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do with my pain? Every campus with heads bowed and eyes closed. Let me say something. We're going to close on every campus in just a few minutes with a song. And this song is called, we've sang it before many times, it's called the anthem. Where we declare our victory. But if you're standing on any campus and you're like, man, I really feel like I need to talk to someone about what's going on in my life right now. You want someone to pray with you, encourage you, show you some scripture, whatever. As we begin to sing this song, all I want you to do is step out from your aisle, step out from your row, and walk to the back of your auditorium, walk out the doors, and someone will be there to meet you, to pray with you, to encourage you. And let me say this, every campus, listen. If you don't know Christ, you can't have victory. Today, I believe with all my heart on every campus that God is knocking on the door of hearts for people to trust Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins because the greatest tragedy in your life isn't what happened. The greatest tragedy is your future without Christ. You need Jesus. So as we begin to stand and sing, I want you, if you're standing and you need prayer on every campus or if you need to receive Christ, you step out and walk to the back. And every Christian on, the, on every campus, listen to me. I want us to sing this song like we believe it. I want us to sing and clap and celebrate like we just won the national freaking championship. You know why? Because we did. 2,000 years ago, Jesus got up from the grave and has been running up the score on the devil ever since. And today as a church body, I just want us to celebrate. I just want us to celebrate by singing this song like we've never sang before. Because in Christ, we're not defined by our tragedy. We're defined by his triumph. Jesus, right now, on every campus, May we sing, may we celebrate, may those who need prayer respond, and may those who need you, Jesus, get up, walk out, just tell somebody, I need Jesus, I need Christ. We ask this in your name.